Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina ve nebiyyina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. So uh, good evening everyone. İnşallah uh, in, in tonight's uh, uh, talk I'll, I'll briefly have a kind of snapshot uh, of the Sira studies and where we are up to at the moment in Sira studies and looking at the work of uh, Said Ramadan El Bouti uh, in one way I'll try to locate it in general Islamic studies uh, that includes fuqh, hadith and sira so where it should be located and also uh, I'll try to locate his work uh, his fuqh sira in modern uh, discussions mo modern sira works Uh, so what, where exactly it is situated and his contribution to the field in terms of methodology especially. Uh, and this will be my second, uh, first half of the talk. And this in the second half, I'll particularly focus on the Fuku Sira and what kind of methodology he uses in this, in this work and give you some examples of this methodology, you know, how it is applied uh, Uh, throughout the life of the Prophet, uh, I'll just briefly vis visit some of the incidents and how he uh, interpret those in incidents or how he narrates that in, in this uh, work. Uh, so this is uh, actually uh, just to refresh our minds, this is the 3D rendition of the house of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So an artist made this. Uh, this has a great kind of significance to understand my, my talk and Fuku Sira as well. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, towards the end of my talk. Just to understand terms first, we are talking about Fuk and Sira. They are not really commonly used uh, together when Fuk is mentioned. It's generally about Islamic legal uh, rulings, Islamic jurisprudence. We, we need to kind of first start from that to understand these terms. Uh, and the, you know the, the the terminology and the mentality behind this expression or why these scholars are naming this uh, sira works as fuku sira fuk as a term as a word in in arabic lexically it means to know and understand and comprehend something deeply it is not a mere understanding but it's really comprehensively and deeply understand something Sometimes it, is, it means understand the ultimate meaning and the purpose of something, working at, at or something to gain an information, a clear picture, obtain a clear idea, devote oneself to study something deeply. So these are all kind of uh, meanings that is presented in, in dictionaries. One particular uh, kind of definition which I really like and it is important to understand Fuku Sira as well, or Fuk in general actually, it, it is provided by Raghab al Isfahani in his uh, Laribul Quran. Uh, so the terms in the Quran that is used, he says uh, Fuk means to reach unknown through known, to reach the unseen via the seen. So this is really important to keep in mind, this definition of uh, Isfahani. So there are some similar words. One may think, you know, what is the difference between, for instance, Fahm and Fuk? Fahm is a mere understanding. Fuk is a deeper understanding and it is more subtle and special. I'll give an example in a moment from the Quran. I think it will clarify what does it mean. But in the early centuries, especially in the first two centuries of Islam, uh, fiqh is used in a very broader sense to understand religion and comprehend religion. It's a deep understanding of religion based on the primary sources, basically uh, on the Quran and Sunnah. The term is used in the Quran 20 times. It, used, it is used a lot in the prophetic tradition The, uh, the usage, the application of the term in the Quran comes uh, and in the Hadith tradition with the religion. Uh, so deep understanding, comprehension of religion is used in the Quran. 
uh, or in the hadith uh, studies uh, in, in prophetic tradition. So this is those 20 verses uh, that are talking about this term or this term is mentioned. It is generally mentioned along the line of uh, its lexical meaning. But just one example, if, if you can look at this chart, this term is used the most in, in chapter nine, which is Surah to Tawbah, which primarily deals with one of the uh, important uh, incidents uh, in Sirah of the Prophet, which is Tabuk, uh, you know, Battle of Tabuk, it's uh, towards the end of a, a year before Prophet ﷺ passed away. So here, in one of these verses in, in chapter 9, uh, hypocrites, you know, the, if you just quickly remember the thing, you know, the context of that verses, a uh, tabuk uh, battle is occurred against Romans. It was extremely hot uh, in summer. And some of the hypocrites, they didn't want to join. And they said, you know, it is very hot. So if we just go to, you know, battle under these conditions, we will lose our life in vain in the, in the desert. And this verse is addressing their understanding. They are kind of understanding, but it is not really deep. They understand that, you know, in the summer in hot conditions, maybe you will, you know, uh, harm yourself, you will die on, on the way. But Quran says, uh, if only they understand the heat of hellfire is more intense. So it like conditions are like they understand they can have an like a, a surface understanding that it is hot, it may hurt, but in fact it, it was really difficult journey but nobody was lost uh, their life. But the, the point here is prophet is calling believers to fight against their enemies. They are having a serious you know, uh, threat towards the Muslim state in Medina. There are some news that then a great army is coming towards them. So these people are saying, you know, we are going to lose our, our lives on, on the way in the desert. It is understanding the physical, you know, atmosphere, but it is not the proper and deep understanding what's going on here. So they didn't join, and uh, because of their, you know, refusal, because of their position against the prophet, obviously the consequences are more severe. That is deep understanding of religion in a way. Anyway, that is the application of the word in the Quran and in Hadith tradition, especially in the first two centuries. That was the dominant understanding when we talk about fiqh. Later on, it become, becomes, especially after second century of Hijra, it became a very exclusive term uh, for the discipline, a sub-discipline, because all specialization started in Islamic disciplines. You know, fiqh became a, a separate discipline, hadith, tafsir, you know, sira, these are becoming a separate, you know, stand alone disciplines. Uh, you know, during that spe specialization time, it became a, an exclusive term for, uh, you know, discipline that deals with the religious rulings, with ahkam in respect to personal or social affairs. So it, in, in another word, it became a term or, or name for the Islamic jurisprudence, mainly because this is a human attempt to understand the meaning and the ruling uh, you know, behind Quranic verses and Hadith tradition, right? Uh, scholars, that is an effort to understand what does it mean, what hukum, what ruling they can deduce from this, uh, you know, two main sources. So it is, that's why uh, they, you know, these sources and the prime kind of uh, uh, main teachings are called sharia, an attempt to understand human effort to understand this is called uh, uh, but this term still continued to be used here and there uh, in a broader or restricted sense. Uh, and Fukusira in that sense is kind of, uh, it's, it's continuation of this application. If you think about, for instance, on the top left, uh, uh, Imam Azam Abu Hanifa's work, he is talking about the main teachings and primary 
uh, Essentials of Faith, and he named that book as Fukul Ekber, because understanding that is primarily understanding the principles and main, main issues in religion. But uh, in a very restricted sense, it's called, it is used in, as we said, legal rulings. That's why Fuk of worship, ibadah, you know, what, how to pray, how to fast, or fukul mu'amalat, uh, you know, when you have a dealing, marriage kind of things, other legal issues have fukh. Uh, sometimes they, some scholars, they authored books, especially the, when Muslims are living as a minority, and this kind of uh, books are called fukul akaliyat. As you can see, even there, there are some books on fukul haya, you know, the concept of modesty and what is the uh, main kind of uh, teachings and understanding in Islam uh, uh, along this one. But when we, uh, just to narrow it down and how it is relevant to, uh, to Fuku Sira, I think we should really focus on Fuku Hadith as well a little bit because Fuku Hadith is, is a term, uh, again, uh, although Fuku is started to use as an exclusive term for legal rulings, it is still continued to find its way uh, in some other disciplines like usul al hadith there is a term fukul hadith in usul works like imam shafi for instance in his risale is talking about that so uh, later on uh, khatib al baghdadi in the 5th century of hijra is speaking about that gradually it dies out in in in hadith studies when, and it kind of resurrects in the late in modern period, really, uh, especially in Salafi sources uh, or so. But uh, what, what does it mean? So it's understanding the meaning behind the pur meaning and the purpose behind prophetic traditions. So how to understand the hadith of the prophet? You know, how we can deduce a rule from a prophetic tradition? It is kind of used in a broader and in a very restricted sense. In a restricted sense, it is along the line of fiqh, Islamic uh, jurisprudence, but in a broader sense, anything that is uttered by the Prophet, how it should be understood, how it should, should be interpreted. So this is a kind of, they, they have kind of uh, ilmu diraya and ilmu riwaya, you know, the traditionalists, those who are focusing on the chain of the transmission in Hadith discipline, but there are some scholars, they focus on the text of the tradition and this is called, called uh, ilmu diraya, how to understand the text, how to interpret the text. So especially in the modern period, uh, uh, this term ilmu asrar al-hadith is used uh, in hujjatullah al-baligha by Shah uh, Waliullah Dihlavi. He is an important uh, kind of figure, especially has an influence in many aspects in Islamic studies. So he uses, you know, the secrets this is a kind of knowledge or discipline uh, to understand the secrets of hadith. So uh, that kind of a debate between, you know, traditionalists who are focusing on the chain of transmission, if something is coming from the prophet or they can utilize reasoning to interpret the hadith or understand the hadith, it is continuing. So let's come to, uh, these are important to understand, you know, the context really behind all these, you know, terminologies and why Sfiqus Sira is important and why, uh, you know, the scholars are using this name. So just very quickly, Sira is, I think everybody would be aware of this, is the, although literally it means a root approach, behavior, lifestyle, conduct, tradition, moral character, life story of a person in Islamic disciplines, Islamic studies is a very ex kind of a, a term exclusively used for the life of the prophet. You know, the, the discipline deals with the life of the prophet in the, independently from his birth up until his death. And it has a very broad meaning which covers all aspects of his life. You know, that could be relevant to his family affairs, his conducts in battlefield, his, you know, social affairs as a governor of a, a state, uh, you know, anything about his appearance, anything about the prophet or if his life story in a chronological way is under the subject of Sira. So, then we are coming to this Fukhul Sira. 
So Fukusira, as you would remember from what I said about the Fuk or Fukul Hadith discussions or discipline, or it's, uh, it's lexical meaning, it is understanding deeply what the life of the Prophet is about, questioning the purpose, wisdom, and philosophy behind his acts and decisions. So it's an attempt to take lessons from the prophetic life. It is concerned about the application, you know, how it is relevant to me. You know, what can I learn, for instance? This is what distinguishes Fikhu Sira from normal classical Sira works. Because in classical Sira works, if you open up any of them, you will have a chain of transmitters, let's say, you know, Fikhu, uh, uh, Sira, Ibn Ishaq or Ibn Hisham Sira or Ibn Kasir Sira, you know, late after five centuries, you know, of these two scholars. Whenever you open that, you will see that they don't really uh, kind of uh, give their own opinions. They don't interpret the events. It's a history. So they try to capture and record the history, history as it is, as it was narrated and transmitted to them. They don't have any attempt to interpret it or put their own opinion there. So you will see a chain of transmission similar to Hadith uh, studies, you know, and you will see that, you know, the event is narrated. Sometimes it's very, you know, uh, scattered, very little information, but still they capture and they record. That is how they understand. And this is capturing and recording. It's a data really uh, of, of Sira. In modern periods, or later on, obviously there are some scholars, they have written, you know, very kind of a smooth, uh, without having a, a chain of transmission, Sira works, but still it is either a piece of, you know, literature uh, that, you know, it's a very eloquent way of transmitting the events in the prophet's life, but m mostly there is not, not much questioning what can we learn you know, why he did so, what kind of ahkam, legal rulings can be deduced from that. You know, if, especially if you think about last two points, the second last two points actually, how it can be applied, especially if, if, if you think about a, a believer uh, from the internal perspective, you know, if somebody is going to follow the methods and uh, methodology, teaching principles of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, what are the methodology? What are the principles of preaching, principle of, principles of, you know, uh, advocating for Islam? You, you know, this is not the primary focus. It is just to narrate the story from birth to death. So it's a chronological thing. Uh, Bhuti says that I could have written something like that, or I could have written a, an extensive work, but I prefer this particular way uh, because of some other issues. So it does also encompass some legal rulings as well. But before we go on to Bhutti's work, you know, to understand what he is doing or what are the main, uh, you know, uh, principles or main kind of approach uh, in his work, we need to also understand what was the main debate among the intellectuals, especially Sira uh, scholars in modern period. You know, if you think about the Sira literature, uh, in last two, three, four centuries, there is a, a, a kind of very uh, extensive work for, from the Western scholars, Orientalists. So, and this uh, approach is mostly critical uh, and it has a, a tremendous impact on the uh, scholarship uh, you know, in, in Islamic world. Uh, and this can be seen uh, in, especially in late, uh, after let's say uh, early is first uh, quarter of the 20th century, you know, in 1950s or onwards, you can clearly see that, you know, the influence of, uh, uh, of Western studies. On the other hand, you know, Ottoman Empire is collapsing and you know, uh, and uh, uh, there is an enlightenment period and Muslim world is kind of questioning, you know, why we have fallen behind 
And one of the thing approaches this approach of modernists, you know, especially in Sierra Wars, I'm looking from that angle, that window, not, not from all, all other disciplines perspectives, when they kind of try to write about the prophet, the Sira became one of the you know, focal points in these uh, studies actually, because Orientalist works are, are focusing either on the Quran or on the Hadith tradition or prophetic biography. So they are very cr critical and so these scholars, they say, you know, we need to rationalize certain things in the life of the prophet. So instead, instead of focusing on miracles, for instance, uh, or his exalted appearance, uh, let's focus on something that is, you know, uh, mandate subject to experiment, or you can kind of rationalize, and it is, you know, it can be accepted by by rationality. That was the main uh, kind of uh, influence. Uh, and it has a dominant effect or uh, in Islamic studies, especially that is coming from the Egypt. Uh, and it has influenced, um, you know, especially after, uh, you know, early 20th century, all of the works somehow are influenced by these studies. There are certain approaches in, and certain scholars, they are really important, especially in terms of Sira studies, is that there was a, for instance, he has authored, uh, you know, uh, a, a Sira work purely based on the Quran. If something is not mentioned in the Quran, he abstained from that narrative. Muhammad Hussein Haikal, Farid Verdi, Mustafa Maraghi, these are influential scholars in, in Egypt. So they also have kind of certain aspects. I'll give two, a couple of examples to give you a better understanding. But what Bhuti kind of, uh, uh, summarizes their approach, he says they preferred subjective Sira writing uh, and subjective and scientific Sira writing, because if it is not, you know, proved by science, if it is not, you know, uh, subject to experiment in the lab, he, they are not accepting it. They, he says they, and it is really individual, anybody can has a, a, their own opinions about the Sira or the Sira writing methodology. But he, this, he says this is a subjective method. They prefer this over impartial, uh, is not based methods. According to uh, Bhuti, you know, Hadith and Sira studies using the isnat system, Jarh and Ta'adil system, you know, you kind of verify the authenticity of the Hadith transmitter, authenticity of the report. This is a very scientific and impartial method. The other one is, you know, based on people's hymns. Sometimes they can uh, just purely deny because they don't understand, they cannot rationalize it. So he says this is very subjective method. So what these people are doing is this, they refuse the, uh, the refusal of the mind to admit the possibility of the unseen. So if there is a miracle unseen in the prophetic tradition, uh, in Sira studies, if it is not mentioned, especially in the Quran, even if it is in the Quran, they tended to, you know, interpret it. But the, the general approach is to abstain from that or refuse it altogether, not really cover in, in their works. They say only way to achieve Islamic Renaissance or revival is to abandon anything that is not subject to experiment or contradicts the science. Even well-attested reports, recorded in the Quran and Sunnah uh, or Hadith tradition is either rejected or interpreted as a metaphor. You know, it's not something actually happened, it's a metaphor. So they name this as a re reform in religion or religious reform. Uh, Bhutti says this is, you know, nothing but expression of emotional subordination and intellectual equivalence in the face of Western, Western Renaissance. So according to Bhuti, this approach, you know, because people are thinking that, you know, okay, uh, Europe, you know, Western societies are well developed because they put distance between science and religion. If we follow the same pattern, same, same footsteps, we will also attain that enlightenment. But he says, you know, look at the Islamic world, the result of this approach, which is, you know, very subjective, 
is neither did they preserve their religious truth, so they lost religion, as well as they didn't achieve scientific awakening. You know, the Islamic world did not really develop by adopting these methods. So how profit is presented in these works? You can see that to, just to rationalize, they say he's a great genius, a dignified leader, hero, a wise man, far-sighted leader. So he possessed all qualities of nobility and of moral, mental, and physical per uh, perfection, but it is all about you know, his far-sightedness, far his being a genius man, and whatsoever. So there is no miracle in his life uh, other than the Quran. Here is Buddhist response. He says, it is futile to place branches where the root once was while ignoring the fact that the root still exists. So he says, imagine a, a, a, a tree, you know, you are talking about the fruits and branches, but you are disregarding its root. So prophets, prophecy, and his miracles are his, the root of this tree. You know, you cannot acknowledge the branches and fruits by simply negating and disregarding the root. You have to first acknowledge the root for the existence of the fruit and branches. Secondly, he says, uh, you know, he, Bhutti argues that we should study his life, prophet's life, not based on these, you know, things that he is a worldly leader, a far-sighted leader, a genius, a hero, how he, he, he actually introduced himself. You know, did he ever say, you know, I am a leader, uh, I am a very powerful and, you know, genius person, you know, this is what I'm going to establish. He primarily focuses on his prophethood. And everything else is really a fruit or a branch of his prophethood. And this is very clear. So let's have a look at two examples before we move on to particularly Bhutti's work. You know, this is Muhammad uh, Hussein Haikal. So he, he is very influential, uh, especially he has a, had a great impact in Sira's studies. To some extent, it died out later on, but you know, he, he, he himself says this, you know, I have not relied upon what is recorded in Sira and Hadith traditions, preferring rather to proceed in, its, in this study uh, on the basis of the scientific method. So he, he is kind of saying, I'm using a scientific method, not Sira and Hadith uh, sources. And he clearly says that he did not wish to understand Sira in a way which would conflict with what is mandated by science. Another influential uh, scholar, Farid Wejdi, he is writing, you know, some journal articles, you know, in this, in this journal, Life of Muhammad in the Light of Science and Philosophy. He says, our readers will have noted that in what we write concerning the biography, biography of the Prophet Sira, we are taking great care not to go to excess in interpreting events as being miraculous, so long as it is possible to explain them based on ordinary causes, even if such explanation involves some degree of awkwardness and force. So he says, you know, even if it will sound that I'm having some forced interpretations for some events like, you know, uh, in the Quran, uh, this uh, Tyran Ababi, you know, the birds in, this, in Surah Tufil, he said this, uh, simply it's like a virus or, or something like that. So uh, the Miraj incident, the ascension is, you know, it's uh, something in the dream, you know, nothing else, you know, it's just a, a dream kind of thing. So if there is a, a, a, any other miracle, he will either reject it or kind of have a, even if it is forced, forced interpretation, he acknowledges that he uses that methodology. Anyway, so let's talk about uh, Sayyid Ramadan al Bhuti and his work. So he is a very influential Syrian scholar born in current day and age Turkey. And he, I think he was uh, four years old when his family uh, left Turkey and they settled in, in Syria and he studied as Azhar University, very well known. And he became a Dean of Sharia faculty uh, in Damascus in Syria, very well known Sheikh of Levant they call prolific writer, a preacher. He has more than 60 books, so many talks. They say he even appears on the television. Uh, 
some some says compete with the uh, with the ruler with the uh, president uh, Assad, and some says he is the second most person who appear on the t TV shows. Uh, so uh, uh, tragically, he was killed in 2013 during the Syrian civil war while he was delivering a, a religious talk in the masjid. And uh, regarding the, the works, Fakusira, uh, Buti himself says, says that it reached the most circulation and popularity than any other book he has authored. So it's very, you know, his, this book is very, very famous. So what he is doing in this work? So he says, you know, why, why Sira is important? You know, how we should uh, uh, kind of understand and uh, approach the Sira. He says Sira studies is not important because there are some great stories, some good anecdotes about the prophet, you know, to understand, uh, you know, that chronological history. It is a practical task, the goal of which is to embody the Islamic truth as seen uh, uh, as a complete whole, as seen in the example, its exemplar in the Prophet's life. So it's to understand Islam completely as a complete whole, you have to understand Sira. I think this says a lot about Fuku Sira as well. It's not just, you know, anecdotal. Uh, memories of the prophet's life. So he says to this goal and its various aspects are sem summarized in five categories. So he kind of approaches Sira in this work based on these five uh, you know, principles, if you like, categories. One is how his character, prophet's character is revealed through his life and circumstances of each incident. So you see there is a different character that is revealed, you know, in each and every incident in his life. Secondly, his exemplary role model in all spheres of life, you know, no matter who you are and where you live, what job you, you're doing, you can see something in his, in his life. So you, and we are approaching his life based on this as well. So thirdly, to understand the Quran, because Quran is talking about the Sira of the Prophet and it is revealed to him and responding to some of the events, some of the questions, some of the problems, so many things in the Quran can only be understood through the Sira narr narrations, really. Uh, Fourthly, to allow Muslims to acquire a sound, accurate foundation of Islamic knowledge and culture. And he particularly focuses on the fifth one because it's important, although it looks like repetition with the second. So what kind of educational methods are there for those who are going to teach Islam or preach Islam? So the book has these uh, following sections, primarily the uh, pre preliminary discussions. So he, here it's an extensive chapter, the beginning chapter, which he talks about the, you know, what I try to summarize, what's happening in the modern world, in Islamic world, and how people are approaching to the life of the prophet in response to challenges of this decline or in, in searching the, you know, uh, reform or revival or enlightenment. So he talks about that very in, in a great detail. Then he talks about the life of the prophet from birth up until his prophethood. And then from prophethood to his death, which is prophetic life, 23 years, he actually uh, has four phases, you know, four stages uh, that he understand and interpret the life of the prophet. These are important to understand what he's trying to do because he interprets events based on these four, four stages in his life. He, the first stage is the secret call to Islam, which is the first three years of his life. And then after the three, third year up until the 13th year, when, where he migrated to, to Medina, to Hijra. From Hijra uh, up until the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which is the sixth year of Hijra, uh, is the third stage and the fourth stage is Hudaybiyah incident and after uh, from there to to uh, uh, to death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
So the final uh, phase, stage four, represents the mandate which Islamic law has recognized ever since and which forms the basis for the rulings on jihad and in Islam. I kind of disagree with the last stage, how he understand and interpret that, but he, he has a point there, obviously, uh, and it can be uh, understood why he is categorizing that as, I would generally interpret the fourth stage at that, uh, that Muslims and the prophet was able to show his, you know, true identity and true message to anybody without intervention, really. But he kind of interprets that as a jihad, uh, understanding the jihad in his, in his life. So what are the main distinguishing features of this work? Uh, I think I have eight minutes to conclude, uh, but uh, I have six kind of categories. One is this book is responding to criticisms or the attempts of reformist or modernists in Islamic work. In one hand, it is responding to Orientalist studies and what where they are critical of. He kind of attempts to respond and give a, a logical explanation to that. And this can be applied to Muslim modernists as well. So instead of rejecting miracles, he is very much, you know, explains why miracles are important and central. Because if you kind of take miracles out of his life, he is like an ordinary person, anybody else. You know, miracles, Quran being the first, is what makes prophet the prophet. You and he says you cannot accept Quran and reject others because they are technically and methodologically speaking, they are both mutawatir. You know, some reports in Sira sources are mutawatir as Quran is mutawatir as well. You cannot deny, you know, one and accept the other one. That is a big method methodological, uh, you know, conflict. You know, you are contradicting yourself, he says. So you cannot just say, you know, his, his personal skills, he was a genius hero kind of thing. You have to relate this back to his prophethood. And one thing some, some argues that, you know, he was born in that Arabian Peninsula to bring them together and kind of establish Arab nation, he has to be as such. And he used some, some, some kind of religious motives to bring people together. It's not really a divinely rooted thing. And he kind of responds to that as well. You can see some methodological patterns in his work. For instance, he uses extensively uses Hadith collections. This is very important in Fukusira. Why? Because uh, people are very critical to Sira works. They say they didn't use, you know, Jarh and Ta'adil kind of things. Uh, Jarh and Ta'adil, you know, this, you know, Hadith methodology and Hadith criticism is there, but this is not applied to Sira, Sira works. So in a way he combines that, you know, most of the reports that he is narrating the Sira of the prophet, he uses Hadith tradition to prove that it has really actually happened. He extensively uses the notion of mutawatir hadith to prove that especially. Sunnatullah is another term the, to explain so many things in this work. Sunnatullah is a divine law. For instance, you will think that why prophet is subject to do, so many difficulties if he was the beloved of God. So he says this is sunnatullah. It is a law in this word as Allah has put gravity he made this a law for believers. You know, all prophets, they have experienced that. These kind of things are very apparent in his work. He says, I'm using objective and impartial hadith and sira methodology. I think he's a, he has a very strong point there, rather than using what they call scientific and subjective method. Another aspect of this work is deriving methods of, you know, tabli, you know, uh, enjoining good, forbidding evil is a ve very important kind of uh, teaching in Islam and in the Quran. So how this can be applied, you know, based on different circumstances and different stages, you know, uh, he always uses this, you know, what, instead of focusing on what happened uh, in the Sira, he always questions why this happened. You know, what are the reasons? What are the lessons? What are the wisdoms? 
how it is relevant, how it can be applied. You know, what is my responsibility as a reader of Sira in 21st century? So this kind of questioning and understanding some principles in teaching and understanding and applying the life of the prophet. Socio-political aspects, because of some criticisms, you know, or because of prophet's life, especially in Medina, you know, you know, a state and rulings surrounding a state is very important or anything about the war or social matters. Uh, he, he kind of focuses on those kind of things. And he has a very kind of careful uh, uh, and very deliberate attempt to uh, underline the role of women in different, uh, you know, scenarios in, in social responsibility, equality, religious responsibility. And he is very he, kind of very much interested in that. And he brings that uh, uh, to, to forward uh, quite, quite uh, regularly. And obviously that fuck, which is understood as Islamic jurisprudence is not neglected. After each and every uh, you know, incident in the Prophet's life, he has an ahkam section. You know, what are the legal rules that can be uh, taken out of this uh, discussion? He talks about, for instance, can we use uh, something, uh, an object or Prophet Sallallahu name to supplicate God? This is called tawassul or tabarrub. You know, can I visit, uh, have a travel to visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi uh, You know, what are the rules about the war? These are the, but there are so many things uh, about Ahkam that he, he talks about personality of the prophet. He is, he uh, talks about this a lot. So he, and he explains his personality, his gentleness, his compassion, his far-sighted leadership, and everything in his life based on his prophethood. You know, if something that is achieved, it is not because he's a genius man. He is a far-sighted man. He is a hero. It is because he is the prophet first and foremost. Then he explains other stuff. So, and he says his personality perfectly matches with his prophethood and his compassion and care and love for the prophet is very much used in this, in this book. I think this is, for instance, mostly neglected in Sira sources. You know, it is very kind of clear in this work, you know, love of God, love of prophet, and the, uh, what we can say, you know, uh, sacrifice of believers in many different forms is very much, uh, Mashid, can I just give one example? So these are all uh, kind of a uh, thing, distinguishing yeah. features of the book. Yeah. Maybe and I'll finish off with one example. You saw people, they would say, you know, these are very technical and, uh, you know, theoretical stuff. I'll get, give one example and stop there, inshallah. It will take a few minutes, not more than a couple of minutes, I suppose. So let's give one example. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, in, uh, towards the uh, age of 40, he had a, started to have a seclusion in the cave, especially six months before he received the first revelation. And he was secluding in the cave sometimes for a, for a week, 10 days, even a month. So then he received the first revelation. This is the occasion in his life. This is at the age of 40 in the year of elephant. You know, it's very clearly it's, uh, recorded in, in Sira sources, the dating of it, so many things. So he talks about all these matters very shortly, uh, Bhuti, and then he kind of questions that, you know, and questions the uh, receive, reception of the first uh, re revelation. So, and he questions why he had that seclusion, you know, and, and how it is relevant, right? This is Fukusira, he is exercising this. You know, he says, no matter how virtuous you may be, you know, your faith is not complete unless you take this kind of seclusions and you have that deep contemplation. You know, anybody who is a believer, who has this kind of uh, spiritual uh, side of him, you know, he will not reach perfection unless he has this kind of practices 
rituals, if you like. And he says the soul of, of a person afflicted with some maladies which can only be cured by the balm of seclusion and self-examination. More so than this, he says, Allah granted him the biggest, you know, the greatest weapon before he granted him prophethood. That is the love of God. And you can only achieve the love of God through these fre frequent con contemplations uh, on his, you know, having contemplation on, on the signs, blessings, greatness of Allah. And he says, this is called tasawwuf, ihsan, or even like Ibn Taymiyyah will call him uh, as ilm suluk, but nobody in the course of Islamic history would reject that. So then he receives the revelation and he is scared. So why he is scared, for instance, he questions that. Why he left the cave in fear? Why he is you know, terror stricken by, by this experience? Why he met with Waraka? Why there is a pause of revelation? Why Archangel cited by him only? Just to respond to the first question, he says, you know, because this is a criticism. He was having a deep contemplation and then, uh, you know, out of, after some times he was enlightened by this, you know, uh, kind of this, uh, uh, uh, this idea and he came up with this idea. He says he didn't come up with this idea, otherwise he wouldn't be terrified. It is something external and this is called revelation and this is called wahi. So that's why he is scared. He was not preparing for that. It is not epilepsy, which some, some uh, Western scholars would assume. It is, it is not inspiration because when you inspire, everybody is inspired and they are writing a book. Nobody is scared. Nobody is going home and saying, you know, cover me. So he kind of explains and questions things like this to kind of understand and give more meaning to it and relate to our current day and age. I'll stop here with this example. I mean, uh, I had a few more, more, more examples, but that's fine. I think this is sufficient. Uh, Jazakallah khayn. Thank you so much. Look, I think we could have gone all night. at such a fascinating topic. But we have a number of questions, Dr. Suleiman. I guess we'll just want to give our audience a chance as well. Um, some of them you may have already at addressed. Um, so if we have quickly go through the questions, you can give, go through some of your examples. If you've already addressed them, you can keep them um, uh, very brief, the answers. So for, question one is, are fiqh and philosophy the same um, interchangeable words? You know, that was the beginning of your uh, presentation. Yeah, that's a good question. I thought somebody will ask this actually. <laughs> and great that, that uh, listeners are very careful. I, I'm pleased with that question. And thank you for asking that. Well, this uh, fuku sira and philosophy of sira is, is used in modern period. Fuk, as I try to explain what fuku sira means, and one of the example, greatest example is fuku sira by Bhuti. Uh, philosophy of sira, to a large extent, is same thing, you know, uh, but I think in philosophy of sira, that concern uh, about uh, uh, rulings, ahkam is not, not really uh, much a big concern. When philosophy of Sira is discussed, I think the main focus is, is similar to Fukushima Sira is to understand the, the main mentality and methodology behind the acts of the prophet. That is a particular focus. You know, it's more narrower uh, than Fukushima Sira. But I would say, you know, those who are using philosophies of Sira, uh, mostly influenced by this Fuku Sira type of works, but developed it further as a methodology to just focus on his teachings and how Sira is dynamically relevant to modern day and age. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and when we say, you know, life philosophy or philosophy of history, you know, you kind of un try to understand the logic behind the acts, not necessarily ahkam, you know, the jurisprudence, law behind the acts. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Excellent answer as well. Thank you. Question two. Who was the first to compile a book in the study of fiqh al-seera similar to Imam Abu Hanifa's fiqh al-akbar, usul al-din aqidah? So was, was there a first person? Well, I think this is, uh, there is not much uh, works named in, in as fiqh al-seera. Actually, there is no work that, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, that is named as you know, fiqh al-seera in classical period. So it looks like, you know, Bhuti is the first person who is naming a standalone study. Ibn al jawzi they say kind of, you can kind of drive a correlation between some, some studies like Ahkam al-Quran works or some of the Sira works. Looks like they're using similar patterns, but Bhuti, it looks like he is the first person and then Muhammad Ghazali, they, they are living pretty much at the same time in modern period. They are the scholars, they are kind of deliberately use this term and they have a certain methodology. I think it's like to further the Sira studies and contribute to, to, to this discipline methodologically. Yeah. So I would say it's a modern phenomenon, it's modern kind of term, it's not really much used in that sense. The, many things can be considered as Fuku Sira uh, in classical period, but they are scattered among different works and you know this is kind of covered to kind of uh, from birth to death uh, capturing the life of the prophet from that particular angle so it's very very um, comprehensive thank you question three is about the zero narrations authenticity there's a question of whether these are cross-checked obviously hadith um, uh, were not evaluated then by the scholars so how, what's the approach to that how are the Sira narrations authentic? Yeah, uh, I think when we uh, kind of uh, think about the devil, I, I have to give a, a lecture on this, you know, about the uh, emergence of Sira literature in comparison to uh, Hadith literature. But uh, to up until the second uh, and second and half, you know, first two, three centuries, scholars who are writing on the Sira and hadith are the same scholars. So you cannot really distinctly distinguish between hadith and sira. I'll give you one example. I think that will kind of solidify and you will have a better understanding. Imam Zuhri, for instance, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, he is a, a great scholar. Zuhri is a student of Urwa ibn Zubair. Urwa ibn Zubair is a uh, nephew of Aisha radiallahu anha, that closer to the Prophet sallallahu in a way, you know, Prophet's wife and his, uh, her student and nephew, uh, uh, Urwa and Urwa's student is Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri. So this person, Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri, is kind of uh, famously known as the first person officially documenting the hadith. You know, the governor of Medina has given that task to him and he documented hadith uh, works, you know, this documentation officially, unofficially, it was there, you know, since the inception, since, since the time of the prophet. Zuhri is the person and okay. he's, you know, he, at, at that time, in, during the uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz time, they started to officially document. Why I'm talking about this? Because Zuhri's student is Ibn Ishaq, for instance the famous, the first, you know, currently we have his book, you know, it is uh, published uh, and we have access to that. You know, same person who is kind of in the crossroad of Hadith studies and Sira studies is Zuhri and his students are the same people, like those who are transmitting the Hadith are scholars, those who are transmitting the Sira works. Okay. The only difference is this, you know, they, they would have same kind of pattern, chain of transmission, same kind of things applies. But the only difference is uh, they are very strict in Hadith sources when they are, accept something as a statement of Hadith. But they are lenient in the Sira works because they are kind of trying to capture the had, uh, Sira works. Mainly Sira works are not used for uh, rulings. They don't really use, use for Ahkam. Yeah. So that's the main difference. But the, the, the thing is, imp the main important thing is, 
Uh, this Fukushima works in modern period, and mo la in later period, most of the Sira works, they started to extensively use Hadith to avoid that criticism that, you know, in Sira works, it wasn't, you know, you know that, that strict. So they say, you know, this information is coming from Ibn Ishaq. It is confirmed by Bukhari's and Muslim Sahih. So how can you reject that? Really, really strong point, particularly the link between uh, the scholar Ibn Ishaq, which is one of the classical works of Sira and Zuhri. Thank you. I'm aware that we're kind of running short of time. So just letting our listeners know that it's 8.02. Um, we're going to quickly, we've got a couple other questions. So if you want to stick around, feel free. Um, uh, if that's okay, Dr. Suleiman, we'll keep going with a couple more questions. Some of them are similar. Um, and we'll hopefully maybe extend for about five more minutes if it's okay with everyone. So question four very quickly, maybe we can keep the answers a bit short uh, if, if possible. Is Ilm al-Daraya al-Hadith the equivalent of Asbab al-Nuzul for the Quran? If not, what is the equivalent study of Asbab al-Nuzul? Ilm al-Daraya al-Hadith. Yeah, it's definitely not equivalent. Asbab al-Nuzul is about occasions of revelation, you know, when and why uh, something is revealed to the Prophet, it's about the, capturing the occasion. It is kind of a Sira work, as Babu Nuzul, really, what was happening and then what came uh, as, a, as a revelation. But the equivalence is as Babu Wurud al Hadith, but it's, it is not definitely equivalent of Diraya to Hadith. So Diraya, Ilmu Diraya, is about understanding the Hadith, how to understand the Hadith. You know what, in a general and narrow sense, to uh, you know understand the meaning behind the hadith, uh, you know, and the uh, interpreting the text of the hadith, the metin of the hadith. But the uh, esbab nuzul is totally different, and it's just occasions of revelation. What was happening during the time of the prophet at that particular time when these verses are revealed. Thank you. Um, I just want to make a correction. Actually, the program is due to finish at 8.15. So we have plenty of time. Sorry, um, everybody. So we are expected to finish at 8.15. We have 10 minutes. Apologies, that was my mistake. Um, who are the people in the photos, somebody asked? Because you had wonderful photos. I think you were talking about a particular scholar and their works. Yeah, I have to go back to them quickly. I, I can just quickly mention those people. Yeah. If they are, this is Buti, I think that's quite clear. Yeah. This is uh, Muhammad Hussein Haikal. He is he became a minister of education sometimes and very influential in terms of modernist, uh, you know, Islamic modernism, if you like. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, at that time Sheikh Maragi, the oh. Mufti of Azhar. You know, at that uh, Buti's uh, sorry Haikal's time when uh, Haikal has written his book. He's the first per one of the first person to approve. And it became kind of the thing, as has voice, you know, as her is approving that, you know, we should stay away from unseen and miracles kind of thing, things. So it's very important. This is Muhammad Abdu, I think, a mind of the uh, Islamic modernism, they call, I think they start modernism with his works. And this is again, Abdu and one of his pupil, his students. Yeah. I think that's about it. <laughs> Yeah, Good no, that somebody cool. asked. <laughs> we love the photo at the beginning of the Prophet Sayyidina's reconstruction of his house. That was so beautiful. Yeah, I see, I promise that I'll talk about this. I can I talk about this for a few minutes? Yes, yes. Okay, that's good. Thank you for asking because I I left uh, three or four slides. This was coming at the end again. Uh, so this is uh, the house of the Prophet Sayyidina. You know, this a three D rendition. An artist, I think. In 2013 or so, they they made this. I I used this and uh, here and there, uh, kind of many times because think about the criticisms or think about the points of this modernist or orientalist. You know, he was after a power, and he was kind of utilizing the thing, religion or these concepts of spirituality to achieve his goal. Uh, right, and. Uh, he passed away in this situation, you know, and if he was after a worldly, you know, empire, if he was after something uh, that people would kind of, you know, expect of him, you know, 
this wouldn't be a lifestyle of a prophet. It clearly shows that, you know, what you, let's say one example I was going to use to clarify this is, you know, negotiations between Meccans for almost 10 years and the prophet, you know, after the public call, they come re repeatedly, you know, very frequently and ask him, you know, if you're after power, we'll give you power. If, to, if you're after woman, we'll give you the best woman. If you're after money, we'll give you money. If you're after this and after that, each and every time he says, I am the prophet of God. I'm not going to abandon what I'm going to say. If you place sun on my right hand, moon on my left, I'm not going to abandon what I'm going to delivering so this is like very this lifestyle of him and what he is saying is perfectly matching mm. and this is a pro prophethood it is when abu sufyan you know he realized the great army of uh, during the the conquest day of mecca he said you know look at the power and the empire of muhammad and his next to him is uh, prophet's uncle abbas ibn abdul muttalib he says, Ya Abu Sufyan, O oh, Abu Sufyan, this is Nubuwa. It is not a, you know, power or it is not a, you know, leadership. It's about the prophethood. Yeah. I think that's very clear in, in both his work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think Zulayha and others have made the point that picture is, speaks a thousand words. So thank you for putting that photo in. It's really did capture and explaining it. Jazakallah khairan. Okay, a um, couple more questions. These two are similar. Question six and seven. Why can't science support religion? I think you were talking, emphasizing about the scientific method, but maybe, and the following question, what do you mean by scientific subjective methods? I think there's a relationship there. Why can't science support religion and can't they coexist? I think you were being talking yeah. about methodology. Yeah. Yeah, I think the methodology is this, you know, we are using, you know, in Islamic studies, in understanding Hadith and Sirah especially, we are using a methodology which is primarily based on chain transmission and, you know, verifying the authenticity of this chain to verify authenticity of the knowledge that is coming through this chain. You know, Isnad is a pillar and chain is something that is, uh, you know, placed uh, upon these pillars. So if pillars are weak, what is on top of is, it is weak anyway. You cannot rely on that. So scientific method, uh, when we say, you know, impartial is not based scientific method, we are not actually distancing ourselves with the, with the science. What we are trying to say, you cannot disregard this methodology, which is unique to Islamic studies, especially Hadith and Sira studies. You cannot kind of completely disregard that and understand something or introduce something totally new to understand this, this you know, civilization, which entire civilization based on this or entire teachings are based on this. As far as you are not neglecting the importance of this you know system and this methodology you can definitely benefit from the scientific methods or science and islam is perfectly matching with the science the problem here is the modernist approach or the some of the uh, modern scholars they say did or you know influenced by the orientalists they say let's disregard that and come up with something new or let's experiment it you know if it is subject to experiment then we can accept otherwise we should reject we are just saying this is not the right way first and foremost let's acknowledge acknowledge the you know impartial scientific methods of is not criticism or hadith methodology which is applied in sira and then you can obviously develop we don't say it is perfect but we say we should first acknowledge that why should we disregard that it is well established and well proven. Yeah, and I think um, the scientific subjective method was, you know, you addressed that in your talk, uh, is what Bhuti was explaining, they're describing their method to be, right? Yeah, he names that as, you know, subjective and so-called scientific method. Yeah. Okay, I think we kind of, uh, maybe have 
time for one more. I might ask a later question because uh, if it's okay. Um, so the last question 12 is about that stories in the Sira are taking some, some claims that some of the stories are taken from Jewish sources and the Old Testament, the Israeliats. Uh, how much truth does this claim hold? Yeah, I think Israeliat uh, works uh, in Islamic studies in general, understanding the Quran history of prophets or prophetic biography. It, it has infiltrated into Islamic sciences. There is no doubt about that. And it is kind of very much uh, understood and explained and clear, you know, which one is coming from Israeliat and which one is not coming from Israeliat. But the, the, uh, I would kind of understand that, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, Prophet has learned something from the previous, uh, you know, religions or scriptures has no basis at all. You know, that, that is very, uh, I think n nobody can prove that. Like, let's say he has learned something from Bahira, you know, the idea that he learned from a Christian monk when he visited uh, Syria. You know, it's, it's very hard to prove that, you know, there is no scholarly uh, evidences to understand. There is no logical uh, evidence is to explain that because there are so many disparate disparities differences between the two tradition on fundamentals even let alone on the details but if there is something that is infiltrated into into works it will be primarily understanding you know some of the uh, rulings about the previous nations previous prophets it, it won't be you know more primarily about the Sira of the prophet. It, they, you know, in Sira's discipline, it is very little compared to, you know, let's say, uh, Tefsir discipline. Okay, we've got one minute. There's a quick question about uh, Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham books available. I think it is. We already, people already shared links. Uh, maybe we'll go to question eight because it's based on Aqidah. Maybe it's an important one to finish off. From the Sharia point of view, what is the authority of Sira, for example, denying a Quranic or authentic Hadith narration is in some instances considered kufr? Does this apply to Sira? So in terms of, you know, if you deny Sira literature, where does this put you in terms mm. of faith? Aqidah? Well, here, yeah, interesting question. And I think it's important as well. Uh, obviously, if something is not mutawatir, it is not really, really strong and it is not in the Quran, it is not based, it's not about the fundamentals, aqidah related, creedal topic, you know, uh, it is not going to affect the faith in itself. But if something is a, in, about the verse in the Quran, about the principles, you know, primary, uh, you know, essentials of faith, rejecting that will it will affect i'll give you one example maybe this will be a very interesting example let's say the isra ascension for instance mm -hmm. you know quran is not explicitly saying this you know this is you know this has happened but there are some verses in surah al isra or in surah al najm about that so it's not a matter of faith you know but but to understand faith is is requirement really if you don't understand the power of god and his names you know his kudra some of his names and attributes you will never understand that so to understand that faith is required but if somebody rejects that i don't think scholars are considering that as a, a as a you know apostasy or they're falling in uh, out of the religion uh, so uh, you know, as I said, the main kind of principle, guiding principle would be if something is about the uh, Aqidah or about the verse of the Prophet, uh, verse of the Quran, then it will be a problem. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you so much. We had two other questions, but we're out of time. Um, maybe what we can do is email those questions to Dr. Suleiman and if we can capture the uh, people who asked them. We'll send it back. So I just, on behalf of everybody, uh, just wanted to congratulate once again. Thank you, Dr. Suleiman Sarakaya. Your passion and your knowledge in the area really came through as you explained the details of the fiqh uh, sira tonight for us. 
a beautiful topic to reflect on our Prophet Sallallahu and we learnt all so much and still comments and questions are still coming through. People are really into this. So I'm, I'm happy to keep going, but <laughs> I, think, um, I think that we, um, we may need to, to, I think the organizers are requesting me to wrap up. Otherwise I'm happy to ask the questions. Uh, but thank you so much everyone for joining us. Please come to our next um, session of SISAC, Charles State University. Uh, someone's telling me to ignore the organizers. <laughs> Somebody likes my pot plan. Thank you. Yeah, we'll inshallah have another topic since it's so popular. We have to bring Dr. Samai back again. Um, I think the Prophet Sallallahu is an ocean and understanding his life would be amazing. Um, so I think, yeah, on behalf of everyone, thank you all for attending and for asking questions, for engaging. Jazakallah khairan. And yeah, those of you who are students, um, enjoy the Sira lectures with Dr. Suleiman or enroll to learn more, <laughs> inshallah. Sorry, I think Murray, we couldn't ask you a question. 